1 Peter chapter 1, it's page 1188 in the church Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 1. So let me pray first and then we'll uh, see how far we get here through the first chapter. If you're new to our Wednesday night study, we go verse by verse uh, through different books of the Bible and uh, we just finished out the book of James last week, so here we are in the first epistle of Peter. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening as we gather here in your house and as we look forward, hopefully, to being able to rejoice with those who are being baptized tonight as a declaration of their faith in you. And we're just thankful for the free gift of salvation and, and just may the joy of the Lord be our strength tonight. May you just fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit to just move in our hearts and to overpower us, Lord, and overwhelm us with your presence. We were so glad to be in the house of the Lord, and we ask now that we would just settle our hearts before you and, and just receive what you would say to us through this first chapter. We're mindful of the kids going back to school tomorrow. We pray for them, that it would be a, a fruitful school year for them and that you'd watch over and protect them. Be with us now as we open our Bibles together. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. This is the first epistle of Peter. You'll notice it's only five chapters long, and then it blends right into Peter's second epistle, separated by about a year. Peter wrote both of these letters. So let's first uh, talk about who he is, just to make sure we all understand uh, who the author is, whom God inspired to pen this letter. Chapter 1, verse 1 begins with an identification of his name. The writer is, in fact, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so here's the background on Peter. He was from a fishing a village called Bethsaida. Uh, Bethsaida translates house of fish or some uh, interpret it to mean house of the hunter. Uh, but regardless, uh, Bethsaida used to be right on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. Now the waters of the Galilee have receded a bit, and so Bethsaida is a little bit further north of the Sea of Galilee, but back in the days of Jesus, Bethsaida was a fishing community located, God bless you, located right on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, and this is where Peter was from. He was a fisherman by, by trade. That was his livelihood. Uh, the Bible tells us that he had a brother named Andrew. Andrew was also an apostle, and that Peter's father is mentioned by name, but there's no reference in the Bible to his mother. Uh, we do know that Peter was married because in Mark chapter 1, it tells us that his home during the time when he followed Jesus was located in Capernaum, which was Jesus' town of his home base for his three and a half years of ministry. And in Mark chapter 1, it tells us that after Jesus had ministered in the synagogue at Capernaum, he went to Peter's house right there in the same town where Peter's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever and Jesus heals her. So we know a little bit about his father by name. We, we know about his brother, Andrew. We know that he was married. And so that's the basic background on, on uh, Peter. His, uh, interestingly enough, his name is mentioned in the gospels, meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John more times than any other human being besides Jesus. So he gets more press coverage in the Gospels than any other person. No one speaks in the Gospels as often as Peter did, and Jesus spoke more to Peter than to any other individual. Jesus rebuked Peter more than any other disciple. Gives you an idea of his personality. Peter was the kind of guy who spoke first and thought later. Um, Peter was the only disciple who dared to rebuke Jesus. Peter confessed Jesus more boldly and accurately than any other disciple. Peter denied Jesus more forcefully and publicly than any other disciple. Jesus praised Peter more than any other disciple. Jesus addressed Peter as Satan alone among the disciples. So you get an idea of just, you know, kind of his makeup, his personality. And since Peter is such a prominent individual in the Gospels, I think it's worthwhile to remind ourselves, or maybe some of you don't know a little bit about him, of some of the important mentions of Peter in, in the Gospel accounts. So here's a few examples. 
When Jesus woke up early in the morning to pray before the sun came up in Mark chapter 1, it was Simon Peter who tracked him down and uh, told Jesus what he should do by going and preaching in the other villages. Peter put his nets out at the direction of Jesus to bring in a massive catch of fish, Luke chapter 5. Peter stepped out of the boat during a raging storm and walked on the water with Jesus, Matthew chapter 14. When other followers deserted Jesus, Peter was the one who said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, John chapter 6. Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, Matthew chapter 16. Peter was the one who asked Jesus how many times we should forgive a brother who sins against us, and then he, he thought it was magnanimous to recommend seven times. In that culture, three times you could forgive somebody, the fourth time you could pop them in the face. So Peter was like, how about seven times? He really thought highly of himself. Jesus said, how about 70 times seven? But Peter was the one who asked at least how often, how much should we forgive a brother? Peter was the one who asked Jesus after the encounter with a rich young ruler what the disciples would receive for giving everything up to follow him, Matthew 19. Peter was the one who insisted that Jesus would not wash his feet, and then he commanded Jesus to wash his whole body because Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can have no part of me. Peter heard Jesus predict that he would deny him three times in Matthew 26, and Peter replied, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Matthew 26, and the rest of the disciples agreed. Peter was the one who cut off the right ear of Malchus. Remember that scene in the Garden of Gethsemane right before Jesus was uh, crucified? You know, this, this mob of Roman soldiers come and Peter takes out his sword and he lops off the ear. You know, I, I think honestly he was just a bad shot. He was going for the neck. He was going for the whole head and he only got the ear. And Jesus, that was the last miracle before the cross. Jesus put Malchus's ear back on. Peter denied Jesus three times, cursing and swearing that he did not even know the man, refusing to even name the name of Jesus in his denial, Matthew 26. Peter was the one who ran with John the disciple to the tomb on the morning of the resurrection after hearing the report of the women that the body of Jesus was not in its tomb, John 20. Peter was the one who received a personal visit from the resurrected Jesus on the day of the resurrection, Luke 24. And Peter received a public restoration of Jesus in front of the other disciples after the resurrection of Jesus. And so there's a lot in the Bible about him. Again, more written about him in the Gospels than any other person next to Jesus. So uh, Peter is the writer of this book. He is uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen these chapters. And uh, he wrote it, it is believed, around the year 64 AD. It was written from Babylon. Now, he, he talks about Babylon, he mentions it in chapter 5, verse 13, but it is probably a euphemism for Rome, a city steeped in immorality. That's why he referred to it as Babylon, but this is probably code word. Um, he's probably writing from Rome, but he refers to it as Babylon because he doesn't necessarily want to give away his location, but the recipients of this letter would understand what he meant by this euphemism. And the recipients are believers struggling in the midst of persecution. Here's why they are struggling in the midst of persecution, and here's why this might be this code word for Rome, but Peter's trying to keep his location on the down low. Because in the year 64, the year that Peter penned this letter, prior to him writing this letter, Rome burned. The year 64 AD was a significant year in Roman history. Rome burned and started burning and lasted for six days. Nero was the emperor at the time, and many of you who remember your history, your Roman history, uh, know what was written about Nero. He did nothing to put out the fire, and so it was said of him, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. He did nothing to put out the fire. And in, and in fact, what many historians believe is that Nero set the fire because earlier in that year, the Roman Senate had denied Nero funding for a refurbishing project of the city of Rome. And it is believed that in order to get his way to circumvent what the Roman Senate had denied him, that he in fact set Rome on fire burning for six days, did nothing to put it out, wanted it to burn so he could then refurbish it out of necessity. And in order to deflect attention away from him, he blamed the Christians. The Christians were blamed in 64 AD for Rome burning. 
And when that happened, the next three years, 64 to 67 AD, became the bloodiest years in terms of Christian martyrdom. Christians were martyred, they were, they were tortured, they were killed for their faith, and the impetus for it was the belief that they had started the fire in Rome. Now, Suetonius and uh, Tacitus, in their historical account of the burning of Rome, uh, both wrote that Nero was the one who set Rome on fire, and Tacitus also wrote in his annals of history how this impacted Christians in terms of how they started uh, receiving much persecution for this. And I'll just quote this couple of sentences from Tacitus. He said, quote, and in their deaths, talking about how Christians were murdered and martyred for this, and in their deaths, they were also made the subject of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts, and he, he writes, and worried, it's an old word that means mauled, mauled to death by dogs, or nailed to crosses, or set fire to, and when day declined, in other words, when night came, burned to serve for nocturnal lights, Nero offered his own gardens for that spectacle, end quote. Here's what Nero did. Nero would tar Christians and then set them upright in his garden and light them on fire as human torches. This is what happened starting in 64 through 67 AD. During the same time period, Peter himself will end up being martyred. Church history says he was crucified upside down. And Paul, during the same time, will also be martyred. And church history says that he was uh, beheaded. And so that's the climate. I got to give you this background so you understand. As Peter's writing here, he knows a little bit about suffering and persecution. So he's writing to believers, you're going to see here in a moment, who are just both Jew and Gentile. If you're a Christian at this point, 64 to 67 AD, you're, you're either in hiding or you're on the run because you're going to be killed. And he writes to uh, who, those he calls pilgrims in the dispersion, Christians who have now been scattered in these different provinces. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are all provinces in what is today Turkey. So Pontus, Galatia, I, I always thought Cappadocia sounded like, a, you know, something on the menu of Starbucks. But, uh, but these are all provinces in Turkey, and these believers have been scattered in these different provinces here. And he calls them pilgrims. Notice that in your Bibles. He calls them pilgrims because, in fact, pilgrims are, are people who are, they're sojourners, they're travelers, they're, they're looking for a better place. You know, when the pilgrims came to America, you know, they were looking for a better place. And, and so the word is translated from the Greek into English to communicate the fact to us that as Christians, we are in that sense pilgrims. We are just passing through this world and we're on our way to a better place. And so don't get too comfortable here. This is not home. This is only a temporary place. We're to impact it, affect it for the cause of Christ and for the kingdom's sake. But we are not to get comfortable here. This is not our home. We don't belong here. This is why Peter would later write, if you flip over to chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. He uses the word pilgrims again. He adds sojourners. NIV says aliens and strangers. The writer of Hebrews used similar terminology in Hebrews 11:13 when he referred to uh, the men and women who were giants of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He calls them uh, uh, aliens and strangers or strangers and pilgrims because, again, you know, they were just passing through. And, and they, they counted their lives not, you know, not significant in, in terms of, you know, the greater eternal reward. And so he starts this letter back here in chapter 1 by referring to believers as pilgrims. That's, that's who we are. We're only passing through. We are, we are, you know, sojourners. Our ultimate destiny, of course, is, is heaven. And so, so he writes here, uh, and he's writing to encourage believers 
in, in their suffering to stand firm in their faith. And what we're going to find here through just these five short chapters is that he's going to tell them to be mindful of two things. Number one, that heaven is our reward. And number two, that Jesus is coming again. So he's going to, you know, um, acknowledge the fact that they're suffering. In fact, the word suffering appears 17 times, New King James uh, Version, 17 times in five chapters. And it's either referring to their suffering or the suffering of Christ, because he makes that comparison, because he's going to encourage them in that way. He's like, hey, listen, you, you know, Christ is not unsympathetic toward your suffering because he himself suffered. But, but that's the whole context here. Now, again, all of us are going to experience suffering to some degree or another, okay, just because we are alive and life has its share of suffering. The particular kind of suffering he's talking about here, however, in the context is suffering for the cause of Christ, suffering for one's faith. And sometimes this is a little distant to our understanding because we have it relatively comfortable in America in terms of suffering for our faith. This is not uncommon to a lot of other brothers and sisters in the world in different places where Christians are constantly being persecuted. So while we read about suffering and we can take to heart the broader uh, uh, comfort that, you know, the Lord is, is wanting to remind us that Heaven is our ultimate reward, and Jesus is coming again, and so, you know, we can have that same sense of comfort. The, the real literal context here is suffering in the face of persecution. So, what they're going through here in 64 to 67 AD is, is really foreign to us in many ways. But I just want to point that out as the context, um, not to be unsympathetic to any of our sufferings, but that what they're going through is unique to this particular time and not uncommon to many Christians around the world today. So he addresses pilgrims of the dispersion in these provinces, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And he says in verse two, he calls them, and this would refer to us to elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so there in verse two, Peter refers to Christians as the elect, uh, the ones who have been chosen. Now then the debate begins, you know, were we chosen according to just the predetermined sovereignty of God or were we chosen as Peter says here, according to the foreknowledge of God? What's the difference? Well, so I think it's an important distinction. Uh, because we are not elect in the sense that God has predetermined some to be saved and some to be damned. That is inconsistent with the overall whole counsel of Scripture. But we are the elect in terms of God's foreknowledge. He knows in advance, because He knows all things, who will accept Him and who will reject Him. And to the degree that we will accept Him, by His foreknowledge, He knows the elect. Don't get wrapped around the axle and start to say to yourself, I'm not sure, am I, am I part of the elect or am I not? You know, am I? Get saved and then you are. I mean, it really is that simple. Like, like surrender to Christ and then you're numbered among the elect. And God knows in advance those who will accept him and respond to his, um, his initiation, which he initiated. He's the initiator. We are the responders. You know, he so loved the world that Christ died for us. We, we didn't initiate the relationship. He did. So in response, we receive and accept him by faith. But in doing so, we become numbered among the elect. And God knows in advance who will choose him, who will accept him and receive him. So in that sense, we are elect according to the foreknowledge. By the way, the Greek word for foreknowledge is prognosko. It's we get, we get our English word prognostication. When you, you know, can tell the future. Well, God knows the future. God knows all things. And Peter mentions here, the Trinity, did you catch that there in verse 2 where he talks about God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood, uh, Jesus Christ. So he's, he's basically saying that God the Father knows who are his, uh, God the Spirit sanctifies those who are his, and God the Son saves those who are his. And then in verse 3 down through verse 12, this next section, he talks about a heavenly inheritance. And what we're going to find here in, in verses 3 through 12 is basically Peter's going to say to us this, salvation is a gift. Salvation is a gift by believing in Jesus Christ. We receive that gift. 
And when we do, we experience, he's going to tell us this, new birth, or another way of saying it is you're born again. Okay, there's a physical birth we all experience when we come into this world. Then there's a spiritual birth that we can experience by faith in what Christ has done for us. We're born again. And he says, in addition to experiencing new birth, you will then receive a new inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. That is the ultimate eternal reward for us. So take a look at verse 3. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, or if you have ESV, it says, who has caused us to be born again. That's what that language means. He has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Just pause there at verse 3. Notice, if you would, he gives glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he's the initiator who, according to his abundant mercy. This is not according to our abundant merit. We have none. All right, this is not according to our good. This is all based on the mercy of God, where according to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again. We experience a new birth in him, a living hope. This is not a past hope. It's a current living, ongoing hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Are we still on? Yeah, okay. So this is our hope for the church. And to, verse 4, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Circle the word heaven. Heaven appears in 54 out of 66 books of the Bible. There are, in the New King James Version, 692 specific verses about heaven in the Bible plus implied verses about heaven. 692 verses. 54 out of 66 books of the Bible talk about heaven. And, and so in the context, Peter's like, okay, listen, this world in many ways stinks and it's difficult and there's suffering. And to them, he's going to you know, you might even die for your faith, but you have this ultimate reward reserved in heaven for you, not gained because of our merit, but offered to us because of his abundant mercy, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice verse 5, who are kept by the power of God. God is a keeping God. And this is the beauty of the balance of Scripture, because, you know, even though, as I just mentioned from verse 2, that, that I believe that there's the exercise of the free will that is undeniable in Scripture. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I believe in the responsibility of man, and that tension meets somewhere there in the middle, and the Bible keeps that tension intact, and I don't, I don't think it's healthy to live in either extreme. So we need to understand sovereignty of God is a real thing, responsibility of man is a real thing. And so while verse 2 implies we are elect based on the foreknowledge because God makes room for the will of man to be exercised in response to his initiation towards us, and thus we enter into relationship with him, guess what? It's not entirely dependent on us to keep our salvation. Because God is a keeping God. Philippians 1.16, what, what does the Bible say to us? Philippians 1.6, rather, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So God works alongside of us as a keeping God to encourage and, and to help us by his spirit to fight the good fight of the faith. In other words, we don't come into relationship with Jesus and then Jesus turns to us in effect and says, good luck getting across the finish line. <laughs> I don't know about you. No, he's the one who is helping us to run the race with perseverance. He's a keeping God who by the power of God through faith, that's what we exercise for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So the revelation of our salvation comes to bear at the end of the age in the last time. In verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. So Peter says, you know, in this present age, we're, we're going to suffer a little bit. We're, we're going to be grieved, he says here, by various trials. Uh, Paul understood what Peter was writing about here. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, and, and I love the language too, because of all people, Paul who experienced so much suffering in his life, physical torment, torture, beaten, left for dead, he would write in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, for our light and momentary troubles. Like, wow. If anybody could have complained, it would have been Paul. But he says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a, a glory and eternal reward that far outweighs them all. All of our light and momentary troubles are nothing in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. When we eventually get before the Lord, you know, all of the suffering and difficulty and hardship of this lifetime, as heavy it is as it is now. Paul says, it's my light and momentary trouble compared to the glory that shall be revealed in Christ Jesus. So we'll pick it up there next week, but for tonight we're gonna end early so we can baptize some folks and rejoice in their relationship with the Lord. Let's pray and, and then we'll be dismissed to the courtyard. Father, we, we thank you for the free gift of salvation according to your abundant mercies, not our merit. We don't deserve the free gift that you've extended to all who would believe and receive, Lord. And we, we're just so thankful that you loved us so much, that you died for us, that you made the way possible for us to have not just our sins forgiven, but have heaven as our eternal reward. And, and Lord, though we understand the context of this letter written to people whose very lives were required of them, even through difficulties of our own, we take to heart these things, that heaven is our ultimate reward and Jesus is coming again. May we stand firm in our faith until that day that either we're with you or you come again to take us unto yourself. We just thank you and we praise you together. And we thank you in advance, Lord, for those who are gonna be baptized tonight. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.